developed that way as well. AltaVista came online about 1995, and it seemed to be the search engine that provided you an immediate view into the world of the web. It gave you a load of results, mixed with adverts, and the only catch was that you couldn't be always filter out the results that you wanted from the uh, adverts and all the other stuff. It wasn't very good. A few years later, Google launches, and all of a sudden we're presented with a search engine that can give you almost an instant access to the results you're looking for. Their accuracy and the speed of their search engine drove the rest of the search market to compete. The marketplace is huge for open source search, and there are lots of different engines each of their own distinct, distinct features, advantages and disadvantages. So today I'm going to show you four and uh, give you a basic introduction to how to use them and how you can use that to enhance your search on your site. The contenders are Apache Solar, Elasticsearch, Sphinx and Zapier. If you've not heard any of these, you may have made by the end of the talk. I've chosen these four because they're quite distinct in their behaviour. Uh, each one of them has a different set of uh, use cases and users and may be more suitable to one project than another. When comparing the engines, I'm explicitly not doing a comparison based on the accuracy of the results or the speed of the results. All of these engines produce fairly accurate results with sub-second uh, sub responses. But the question is, is, as a developer, how good is the documentation? Is the documentation readable and easy to find? Is there an API for PHP, and if so, how well documented is it? And how does it, uh, does it offer complete access to the features of the system and how, how varied are the built-in features? Also, how is support handled? Is there a mailing list? What's the response time like? So my comparison essentially is based on how, e how good each product is to work with. So what I did is I took some data from one of my clients, a company called Report Bio, who sell online market research reports. They have a database of a quarter of a million reports, which consists of 1.6 gigs of textual data and a load of numeric data as well. We need to be able to search that data and present people with results that um, give them the product they're looking for to find on the first page of results the first time. So what we have in the data are, we have a bunch of text fields, title, subtitle, summary of contents. Those are basically the full text indexes that we'll generate during this talk, or at least that I generated for the research of this talk. We've also got a product code and an ISPN. These are unique fields that need to be matched on above everything else. If you put a product code in or an ISBN, if you're like Waterstones or Amazon, you want to make sure that you find exactly the right product the first time. We also have things like suppliers, category, product type, and availability. That allows you to refine the search based on your initial searching uh, in, from the textual content of the search. We also want to be able to filter by publication date and price. These are the things that um, we need to be able to search for in So the first one I looked at was Apache Solar. It's one of the industry leading engines. It's uh, an enterprise class search engine, which means it's scalable. It has um, more facility in it than anything else in the market. It does transactional updates. It does faceted search. It does geospatial searching. It has uh, rich document indexing. It's got a web-based admin interface. It's got RESTful uh, interface. And it's also got a Peckle extension. And it also has built-in uh, caching of queries and data. So when you first start uh, Solar up, one of the first things it does is it tries to warm its cache and pre-populate with lots of queries that it's sat had before. It also has a numerous amount of plugins as well, which allow you to extend the, uh, extend the system, and I'll be looking at one of those today as well. Uh, solar installation is relatively straightforward. It's available as a system package. It uses either Tomcat or Jetty because it's Java-based and requires a server engine to make it work. One of the catches of that is that you need to restart the server engine when you change the configuration. This means that if you're doing this in a live platform environment, you need to have something to switch over to when you update your, con update your config. All of the packages installed as a service so that uh, maintenance and the uptime you get from it is pretty much guaranteed. When you configure Solar, uh, one of the things you have to think about is where you're going to store your database, how much memory you want to give it, what query caching options you have, and what kind of request handlers you want to set up. And also whether or not you want to use any of the optional search compilers and plugins. 
It also has a uh, spell check capability, which can be really handy when you have people looking for uh, research and can't spell it, or other, other names of companies or other such things. When you configure um, Apache Solar, it's all configured through two XML files, one of which defines the system config, which is where you tell it where to store everything, and you also have to configure each field based on the type of data you're putting in. It's quite a strongly typed system in that respect. And these are the fields that we're indexing in terms of what's coming out of the port by data. We have a GUID, which we use as a primary key, which is defined at the bottom with a unique key item. And we have a number of other text fields, which we say are uh, text fields. And in uh, Solar, you can also choose the store fields in the index as well. And one of the reasons for doing this is that when you use these kind of engines, they're incredibly fast. You get microsecond responses, and one of the things that you could do is to get the, just store the item good and then retrieve the full product data from the database to display this to users. That's pretty inefficient. So what we do in, in uh, search engines is we store the data twice. Essentially, once in the index and once in the main database. What we have as well on here is we have a bunch of uh, copy fields which basically allow you to create one massive text field that contains all of the, um, uh, all of the main textual data so that when you type words in for your query, you can get back results from the title, the subtitle, the table of contents, or the summary. We also have a boost field set up which allows you to prioritize certain fields. We want people who are putting in text to be able to find uh, the product name first. We then want to have them search for the subtitle. We then want to search in the summary and the table of contents in that order. We also want, as we said earlier, to be able to find products based on their ISBN and product name. So we have a very high boost field. And what that means is that all those fields are prioritized over the main content of the text. There are a number of options to get data into Solar. There is something called the Data Import Handler, which is a plugin which will take data from MySQL, XML, or a number of other data formats and import directly into the Solar Index. There's a RESTful API, which is their primary method of uh, communication to the rest of the world. There's also a PHP Packet extension and then third party libraries as well. Uh, like Solaria, which is one of the ones I looked at in this project. One of the reasons I chose to use uh, Peckle Indexer is that it seemed to be the sim uh, simplest uh, interface to Apache uh, Solar. I have a mentality which says, I want to just get this stuff done, I don't want to get it quickly. And that means take the simplest tool and have a go at it. So here we have some code that just shows you, you connect to the Solar uh, server, you look through your list of uh, documents from the database. You have to do a date translation on the uh, publication date, and you add the document to the index. The one thing you do have to do with uh, Solar is commit all of your changes. It's transactional based, which means that, obviously, if something goes wrong during the import process, you can just cancel it and the system will roll you back. You can also index through the RESTful interface as well, which uh, you post to a particular URL, you send in all the fields that you need, and it will then return your response saying whether or not it's gone in successfully or not. <coughs> you can also query Solar using PHP directly. Uh, in this case, I'm using the Solar client. And what the Solar, the advantage of the Solar client is, is that for me, well, I'm not very good with doing REST interfaces on my own. I'd rather have a library take all the complicated processing of the REST query out of the way and generate all the code for me in the background. So here I'm telling it I want to do a research with the term research in China. And I tell it what fields I want through the add field option. I tell it I want to sort the results. And it then gets me the query back and the uh, list of responses coming out of the system. All of the data that comes out of this is straight out of solar. So I don't have to do anything in order to get the results on the screen. Which gives me a very, very fast response time. You can also uh, execute queries through the RESTful interface. So you can either do it as a query screen, as I've done here, and you can also do it uh, using a, a post query. So what happens with this is you automatically get back, uh, by default, you get a, uh, an XML object. You can also tell Apache to give you back JSON text, which means that if you're building an application, a uh, web application or a mobile application, you can directly interface with the uh, Apache Solar system and get back a result so that you can display that without any translation in between. That cuts out significant time of processing on the server side and also in terms of the, the display of the data, which is something that I've done in another project. 
Um, so here we can just see we get back a bunch of essentially just product data from the field of Arctic, and that allows me to display that to the user. Um, Apache Solar has more features than any other product in the marketplace. It also has more annual conferences than any other product in the marketplace, and it has a very responsive, busy mailing list. It has a very large team of developers, most of whom work around the core product Lucene, which is a Java engine for indexing data. And Solar extends upon this by adding a whole bunch of other stuff, including a web interface and all the plugins that come with that. It has good PHP libraries for integration, and there are several books available. But one of the problems with um, Apache Solar is that it has a fairly heavy footprint. So initially, when I looked at this a few years ago, what I found is that running uh, Jakarta, for example, um, meant that, uh, sorry, Apache Tomcat on top of uh, Solar meant that you would need to use quite a lot of RAM in the system to be able to uh, actually run the search service. These days, memory and disk space are not such a big concern. So generating a big, in big index or running a, a chunk of RAM to run a search service isn't such a big deal as long as you get a good product out of it. Um, getting started with Solar, one of the problems I had was that I got completely lost. The documentation online, there's so much of it, it's very hard to find a simple answer to anything. And one of the things I wanted to find an answer to is how does it rank and weight, weight the responses? For people who work in the information professional field, this is quite a key point. I mean, it's how, how you basically work out which document is people are actually looking for. And I couldn't find a straight answer. I found a page that linked me to another page with a broken link, and then I had to search around to find an answer, and then just found a whole page full of maths, rather than a straightforward, you know, this is what we use. And to me, um, documentation is everything. I want to be able to go to a product, find some sort of quick start guide, and be able to work through examples and figure out how the system works. I'm sadly not one of those people who just jumps in at the deep end and goes, oh yeah, let's just try this. Um, and in that respect, Solar has a bit of a problem because it does have an example on its site, but it doesn't tell you how the example works or how you configure it. So you're kind of in at the deep end already. The next product I looked at was Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch has been talked about a lot recently because it basically tries to take what Solar does and makes it easy. They claim on their website to be the fastest, easiest, most scalable server there is. And actually it does do some good stuff. Um, one of the things it does is it is entirely uh, JSON based. It also runs on Apache Lucene and it has a, a very clever, completely automated clustering model inside it that uses um, uh, multicast networking to be able to find other nodes within the cluster on a local area network. So that, for example, if you suddenly want to scale up, you simply start a, a, an Elasticsearch instance, tell it which cluster it's part of, give it a name, and it just does everything else self to self. It also integrates with um, CacheDB because it's uh, JSON based. And one of the things with CacheDB is it's a NoSQL database and it is document based, so you don't have to really define a schema for it. You don't have to define uh, what your fields look like or really what you want to do with them. You just bung in a bunch of data and it figures it all out. It can also support, which is uh, quite unusual, a completely configure free model. As soon as you install it, it will work to a point. Um, you can have multiple indexes within the same instance or within the same cluster without actually having to configure each one individually. Um, the installation is ridiculously easy. You simply download the zip file and you run the Elasticsearch program and you're ready to go. That's it. It's the simplest installation of all of the products. Um, there is no schema that you require, almost, and there's no configuration that you require either. However, um, what I've found is that it does actually help to have some sort of configuration involved. So, one of the things with Elasticsearch is that nothing exists in Elasticsearch until you request something. So all we have here is a GET request that's not on the slide now. And uh, what you would do is you would uh, send a GET request to the uh, uh, server just to see if it's alive. And here, this is the response you get back, and you basically continue to get random responses to pitch up this guide until you get bored, which is kind of fun, but doesn't really help. So the first thing I did with this is I tried to configure a tokenizer. Tokenizers are things that basically take words and turn them into their basic form, in the same way that the stemma does. So for example, the tokenizer turns everything into lowercase, so for indexing you can do case insensitive searches. 
And the stemmer takes words like colour, colours, and colour them, and take, turns them into just a simple basic colour. This means that plural detections and other such features are easily dealt with. When you uh, first set up with uh, Elasticsearch, as I said before, it's kind of clever. It tries to work out what um, types of data you have and just deal with it automatically. And one of the problems in my particular research is that I wanted to give certain fields a weight. And the only way to do that is to tell it explicitly what fields you have and what weights you give them. And so here we've got a quick example of some code that does that. One of the things that I also need to be able to do is I need to be able to index the data I have by the item GUI. So all the products in our catalog have a GUID rather than a numeric ID, simply because that's the way we design the system. And so it really easily takes this on board. You simply uh, call a library, and you uh, set up a JSON block which contains that data, and you tell it to map the data, and it does it. You then have to be able to index the data, and uh, to do so again, it's really simple. It, because it's just taking a block of JSON, all you have to do is run your SQL query, loop the rows that are in the query, and add them to the Elasticsearch instance. You simply tell it which uh, type of, uh, which index you're using, so in this case we have a reports index, and we, you tell it what type of document you're indexing. So in the same Elasticsearch instance, you could have 53 different databases, which you call a type, <coughs> it's a context, and you'd have a number of different document types within that database. So you can, in theory, simulate something close to the way that relational databases work here. Um, one of the issues I found with uh, Elasticsearch is that there isn't really anything that comes out of the box that tells you it's working. Um, what you can do is you can do a request uh, to find out the number of records in the database, which is what I've done here. It tells you there are 260,349, which is the full database. There is, however, a plugin called Head, which allows you to see a brief overview of the database. You can browse some of the data, you can see what the cluster health is, and you can do tests on things like the tokenizer or the stemmer, which are really helpful when you come to design the database. For example, in my case, I found that the tokenizer worked in here, but it didn't work when I actually ran queries, which is possibly a bug. Um, querying in Elasticsearch <coughs> is, again, relatively simple. You simply tell it that you want to use an Elasticsearch instance. You tell it what fields you want. You put in uh, a search term. And you tell it, for example, whether or not you want to have facets. Um, quick question, does everyone know what facets are? Okay. So faceting, uh, for those of you who don't know, the uh, best example is eBay. If you look on eBay and you do a search, down the left-hand side you see the categories, and with them are little numbers and brackets. And that's a facet. What it means is as it performs your search, it goes through, and as it's running through the search, counts up all the different variations <coughs> of a particular category or a particular product type. Facet generation is um, pretty much uh, gold dust of the search. It allows people to start with a search term and then work, drill their way down through categories to find what they're looking for. And by showing the numbers, it gives them more of an advantage of where they're actually supposed to be looking. So facet generation with Elasticsearch is really easy. As you can see here, you just simply tell it you want some facets, you tell them what you want to call it, and you tell them which field you want to do and it will return you some data. <coughs> there are a number of APIs available. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have said it returns the data as JSON, so actually passing it again has the same advantages that Solar does, so that you have this immediate uh, access to the search system through whatever mechanism you want to do. There are several APIs for Elasticsearch. Uh, there's one called Elastica, which looks like the most popular and the most busy. There's another one called Elasticsearch, and there's another one called Elasticsearch PHP. When I was working with Elasticsearch, one of the problems I found was that uh, the documentation is all over the place. It, um, the documentation on the site just takes you around in circles in certain, certain instances. There's a mapping section that links to another mapping section that links back to the first one that doesn't really tell you anything. And uh, it actually drove me a little bit crazy. I honestly don't know at the moment how usable Elasticsearch is simply because there's no way for someone who doesn't know how to use it to kind of get in and actually start using it. It is, however, pretty fast at indexing. Um, in the tests I did against the other products, this was the second fastest. Um, it has the auto-scaling architecture I talked about earlier. 
it has a very elegant first approach, which means that you don't really need to do anything except perhaps use a library that works in order to get data in and out. And because of that first approach, you can extend this onto multiple platforms. The zero configuration model for most projects is great. It means you just switch it on and it works. However, as I said earlier, the documentation is pretty poor. The documentation on the APIs is also pretty poor. So, for example, <coughs> Elastica, one of the uh, more popular ones, has documentation how to get data in, but not really how to get it out. It has an API documentation, but half of the functions don't tell you what they do, and half of the functions don't tell you what the parameters are, or what you need to pass in, or what you get out. The other thing that's really missing from the Elasticsearch site is an overview of what the product is, like an introduction to say what features it has. And the only place you can find this information is in the readme, and I don't even know if that's complete. So you end up with uh, no real conceptual model or no real understanding of how it works internally. There's also not very good description on the query language that you use to get data in. The other thing is, is that Elasticsearch kind of works in the same way that CouchDB does, in that you pass it in a block of JSON data, you can tell it what you want to store and what you want to index, but it goes and stores absolutely everything anyway, which means you end up with a rather large index based on your data. The 1.6 gigs I had turned into 3.2 straight away, which, in dealing with a very large database, could become a bit of a problem. The next one on my list is Sphinx. Um, Sphinx, I wanted to look at for quite a long time. I've heard a lot of things about this, and I've heard varying reviews. Sphinx is a really bizarre product because it came out of one guy's uh, passion to be able to get data out of uh, MySQL faster than using full text search. We used to use full text at work, but it basically became came to the point whereby things weren't accurate. It was taking so long to run queries, it was practically impossible to do anything. So Sphinx was developed to meet that need. It plugs very well into MySQL, straight out of the box, and you don't even need to do anything to make it index it. You just tell it where your table is, you have a SQL query, it goes away and reproduces the data and indexes it. It was the single fastest product uh, I looked at. It was able to index the 1.6 gigs of text data in about five minutes, which is quite astonishing um, given the amount of uh, volume of text. You can query it through either the Sphinx PHP API, or you can uh, uh, search through SQL queries. So uh, one of the things that Sphinx has is something called Sphinx Query Language, which essentially is a rather clever little trick. It runs essentially a MySQL server, which acts as the, Sync, the Sphinx index. That allows you to do searches on the index using standard SQL queries, which I'll show you in a moment. It scales well. Uh, one of the biggest examples is six terabytes of data on 15 servers, and 16 billion documents handling 2,000 queries a second. So it's quite fast. It's used by creators and board readers. Craigslist, I think, has the six terabytes of very board reader, and uh, 16 billion documents are in board reader. It also runs as a storage engine in MySQL, which basically means that it's a plug and play job. You can install it as a storage engine, you can simply tell it <coughs> what tables you need to store in it, and it goes away and indexes everything, and you don't even have to do anything to access its advanced search capability. Installation for Sphinx is actually really easy. It installs from system packages or source, although if you want to use the PHP uh, API, um, you do need to install this from the source. There is no other service that, uh, software that's needed, and it runs as a, a separate service in Ubuntu and other operating systems. Um, it has a number of different index types. It has something called a plain index, which is basically for read-only tables, and has a very, very fast search that takes a while to update. It's also read-only, so once you put data in there, you can't make any changes to it, which seems a bit pointless, but in certain cases where you may want to do so. There's also a new, excuse me, real-time index, which allows you to update data on the fly. It's quite fast, but it's apparently less efficient. In the test that I did, it ran just as fast as anything else, so I don't see the disadvantage of using this. Um, or you can use a distributed model, where you can mix both a plain index and you can have an incremental real-time index, so that, for example, if you have 10 million rows of data, which is in there currently, you want to import that, you can do so, and then you can use a uh, real-time index on top of that to map all the changes and do a weekly merge between the two. So it's got quite a complicated storage process. But using it is actually really easy. 
It has a really simple configuration file that tells you basically what type of index you want to use. Here I'm using a real time index. You tell it where you want to store stuff, and you tell it what fields you want to store and what fields you want to get back out of the database. It also has what it calls morphology preprocessors, which are essentially just stemmers. So basically, they will take, uh, uh, as I say, uh, your colors, coloring, color, and basically turn it into a single word that you search with. It also has a handling feature of stripping out HTML and taking out uh, various bits of elements from HTML as well. So in our example data, we have table of contents, which is formatted in HTML, and you obviously don't have people finding TRs and TDs in their results. Indexing the data with Sphinx uh, is really, really easy. Um, with a real-time index, you can't use the PHP API. Now, I'm not entirely sure why this is, but it actually makes real good sense. Um, one of the problems, though, is it can't take any identifier as uh, a document ID. You have to use sequential, um, uh, sequential integers. So what I've done is I've taken a, a, a class conversion function and turned my horrible 32-digit hex code back into a single integer. And then uh, pass it into uh, my, uh, MySQL. So here, uh, the red line is where I connect to the um, Sphinx interface, and I fetch my results from my original SQL connection, and then create an insert statement, or in this case, a replace entry statement into the index, and just pass all the data in. And that's it. It's ridiculously easy. Getting data in and getting data out of Sphinx is unbelievably easy. If you want to query the data, what you can do is you can use MySQL to connect to it, and you get a MySQL command prompt, as you'd expect. You can then just access um, you can then just access a select statement, and you get back some results. Obviously, here you get a waiting scheme. You get some of the other data I've asked for, and you can uh, update tables on the fly as well. So that if you need to change, for example, one of our use cases is that we would say remove a thousand products in one go. You just simply delete a thousand products, and it's done. It does it in less than a second. And if you do things like price changes, which happen on a fairly regular basis with us, um, those happen almost instantly as well, which you expect from a normal SQL table. Um, Sphinx was the fastest of all the indexing engines. It indexed the data I gave it in about five minutes, which is astonishing. The slowest was Solar, which was a bit of a surprise given it's supposed to be in this video. And it has that really simple interface via SQL. But again, you do have to have document IDs based on unsigned integers. And there's no faceting support. So for those of you who don't want to uh, use faceting, it's fine. Um, but for catalog sites or e-commerce and things, it can be a bit of a pain in the ass. There is, however, uh, experimental faceting support through Python, but uh, I have not gone that far to find out. There is, however, good support from both forums and the company that makes things. It's quite unusual, actually, that the, the product itself is uh, supported by, not so much by the developers, but they offer a paid support option. In all the other ones, there's a third-party company that doesn't, isn't run by the developers, but uh, basically makes money out of supporting the product.
as a query parser, so that um, you don't have to think about processing queries as you, as you get them. In some engines, you have to seriously take everything that's put in and add pluses and minuses and quotes and brackets and things in order to get data out. It has fairly good stemming built in. It has fast search as well, which means that if you're doing the kind of fasting stuff, you don't really have to do that to, to achieve that either. It also supports server replication. So, for example, you can have a cluster of servers that uh, you can query from as well. One of the things I have to point out about this is that this product itself, because it's just a library, uh, it accesses files directly. It doesn't work very well over NFS. We found this out to our error about six months ago when we brought down the entire hosting platform because the NFS network was getting so clogged up when we did an update. So if you do run this software, you need to run it on local disk only. We install it from a system package and you compile the PHP file from source, as I say. You don't need anything else, and it just runs on demand. There's no service, there's no overhead. When we started looking at SAP, we wanted something really lightweight, and this is it. Um, as with a few of the other engines, there's no configuration required. You don't have to, uh, once you've installed it, all you have to do is call it and tell it what fields you've been put in it, and that's it. There's a uh, define a go schema, um, and Zapien works on the basis of documents, terms, and values. It doesn't care what type these are. It simply just has either numeric or textual. Um, documents are, for example, best related to is like a row in a database table, and they consist of a number of terms, uh, values, and document data. Terms are the textual part, which gets indexed as part of the full text search. Values are things that you can't index, but you might have to sort by or refine by. And there's also document data, which is where you store additional information about uh, your, your products that you want to retrieve when you get your results back. So for example, one of the things that we do is we take the, uh, the full product data or a summary of the product data, store that in a serialized array and bind that into the document data. That means that we don't end up increasing the size of the index much, but it means that um, when we want to get things back, again, we don't have to query the database. Indexing data uh, data is a little bit more complicated than some of the other things. What we have here is we tell it that we want to create a new database. We tell it that we want to use a term generator, that we want to set spelling to English. It supports, I think, 18 different languages as well. So out of the box, you can deal with French or Italian, and your system will just work. Again, you loop through your uh, array, you create uh, your results array, you create uh, a document, you um, tell the term generator which document you're going to be looking at, and then you loop through all of the different fields, and you can give each different field a different weight. So at the start, we said we need to have title, then subtitle, then sub and then table of contents. Doing that in this is actually very easy. We simply then just add all the uh, information into the document. We then have to add the, uh, the name of the product as well, and we give it a special prefix. So in Zapier, you can have prefix fields, which allows you to refine your search just within a particular field. In the same way that you can with all the others. Um, in, the, in the other things, you have field names. In this case, you just have prefixes. As you can see here, the name of the product is being given a weight of 75, and it's given prefix S. Zapier guys are information retrieval professionals, and they have come up with a really bizarre list of prefixes that they use as standard, but you can use anything you like. So the next line I'm just prefixing product codes with the word code, because it makes sense to me, and it doesn't seem to add any kind of overhead to the system. Um, you also add in all your values. Now, with Zapier, the values are a little bit like having a kind of static array. Every value has a slot, a numeric slot. So, for example, in slot one, I have price. Um, and I have a publication date in the next in the next slot, which would be slot two. If you ever come to change where things live in terms of slots, one of the things you need to do is completely re-index the database. It's a bit of a pain, but generally when you set up with a database indexing system, you're probably not going to change it that often. Um, one of the things that is important to point out here is that um, when I'm passing stuff into a slot, I have to serialize the number. The reason for that is that Zapien treats all numbers as uh, binary strings, so it doesn't know what type it is to float or anything like that. And in the same uh, same way, um, the 
dates are processed into a generic date file, which I think is ISO something like that. Um, because that way you can sort, uh, sort and filter by dates within ZP without it having to do any computation as it says. Um, I also add another thing in for availability, which tells me whether or not my project is available for immediate download. And I serialize the last block of document data, as I said earlier, set that up. At the bottom, I tell Sapien and I use the item group for the document ID and the place in the database. Updating works in exactly the same way. You don't have to do anything different between creation and update. It just, it just works. Um, querying the index in Zapier, um, you, again, you have to instantiate the Zapier database and tell it that you want to use the query parser. And you, again, set up your stemma. You could also set up a default operand. And this is a bit of a contention point because most of us have learned to work the way Google does which is using uh, what we call op-and. So the and, the and for gives you a search for all documents that contain all those words. In reality, people don't tend to use that so much. They actually want to find a bit more of a flexible search. So when someone's searching our product catalog, you can uh, put in all the different words, and you might want to find out which products have some of them, but not others. Um, we also have a date range value processor, which is one of the things that allows you to find products within a particular uh, date range. Um, we also tell the uh, query parser that when people execute queries, <coughs> they can specify uh, a field to have a particular prefix. So code becomes the Zapian term prefix code, category becomes the Zapian term prefix category. So that when you execute your query, you can just type code colon and it will find a product code <coughs> based on that. And again, title uh, becomes the Zapian standard prefix S, simply because that's the one that they use. And we tell it that we want to find a, a query. Uh, we want to find medical devices near the word China, not including Russian. We want a price range of £10 to £150. We want to find it within the category medical. It then goes away, builds a query, processes it internally, and gives you back results. As part of this, you can also add your uh, facets which I didn't include because I ran out of screen real estate. But um, when you execute facets within Zapier, what happens is, is it runs through the database, it looks at all the uh, records as it matches each of the different parts of the query. So for example, the first part would be medical devices. So it runs the process of that, it counts up which uh, products uh, match which facets within that. Then it does near China, then it does not Russia, then it does a price range, and then it does the category. So you can end up with uh, quite a wide, wide range of facet values depending on what you're asking. Um, and then you simply tell it that you want to execute the query, you get the result set, and you loop through it as you'd expect. It has uh, only one PHP API, which is the PHP bindings. Uh, it does require the additional compilation stuff that I talked about. It doesn't have a very well documented API, which is a bit of a shame. But one of the things that Zapien does have for it is a getting started guide, which none of the other products have. Uh, in fact, it's sorely missed in all of the other products, with the exception of Sphinx, which has quite a good user manual. Um, so the getting started guide takes you through some uh, data sets that they took from the Science Museum and teaches you how to index them and then get results out and use some of the slightly more advanced features that are in there. Um, so, in summary, um, one of the things that I found is that not every project needs, has the same needs. Um, not each one of the search products will fit any of the search tools you want to use or the search needs that you have. The fastest to index my data was Sphinx and the most feature rich obviously Solar. Um, the next steps in terms of what you want to use are entirely up to you. But the way it looks like is that um, Elasticsearch is probably going to be the forerunner for search as soon as they fix the documentation and the numerous bugs that keep popping up. Um, that's it. Any questions? In the last product, Sapien, yes. um, is it a Windows only platform? Or is it one it's one? available on, I think, five or six different operating systems. I run in Linux, but I do know there was a Windows binary. Okay. Um, were you 
use a lot of scientific data in Latin terms. Is there a particular search engine would, would that have any influence on any of the choices? Not really. How do you use the Latin terms? I don't really understand. Are you yeah. saying that you need a dictionary to support uh, Latin stemming? Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of scientific terms in our, in our data, and just whether there's any issue really. I don't um, think there would be any issue at all. Um, although what you might find is that you might need to find a specific stem of the Latin. <coughs> so, for example, plurals in Latin are probably very different from English. I don't know Latin. Um, but there will be a there will be a search engine that does what you want out there. If anything, it would probably end up being Solo because it's the most popular and it's used by you know most of the world in terms of search. <coughs> I have one question. If you know how it works with the full text search uh, for you know, DB engine on MySQL, if this might be a solution for somebody? Um, in terms of which product, or just generally? Uh, just generally, yeah. Well, one of the things uh, I know is that the InnoDB or the MyISO engine makes no difference to any of these products. Uh, for example, uh, Sphinx will, it doesn't care, it just uses SQL query, so as long as you can execute your SQL query, you can get your results in. With all of the other products, um, again, it's pretty much uh, storage engine agnostic. <coughs> so you can use whatever you like as long as you can execute the query and retrieve the data. Um, I've got a question that's about scaling. Uh, I've got a question about scaling. Um, we were using uh, Sphinx, and uh, they generally things tend to scale better when they're installed. Server side, but it seems Sphinx needs to be installed closer to the, the database. <coughs> um, how well does Sphinx scale, or should we be installing it somewhere else? I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. I haven't uh, looked into the scalability in any great depth. What I'd suggest is that it probably does need to be on the same platform, probably physically as the database server. If I were running a platform where I had, say, 10 database servers, I'd want to have a Sphinx instance on each simply to cut down the communication time between the Sphinx instance and the uh, MySQL so that you don't get network lag or latency. <coughs> yeah. um, so Sapien stores all of its data in a static file on the file system. It's just, yeah, you have an APA interface library to that. How, um, you also said you have issues running and storing that file over NFS, so how do you go about scaling uh, a Sapien installation or is there, is that essentially, could that only be used for fairly small? No, it's, it has a replication facility, so that you can set up uh, multiple servers that replicate asynchronously between each instance. Um, the only thing with the, the NFS is just it doesn't work on network file systems. Uh, do any of the three service installations support some kind of parallel search? As in Shrouded indexes and then searching on all of them at once and then co collating the results. Or yes, both Solar and Elasticsearch do that. The others, I don't, I don't think they do. Any other questions? <coughs>